So in the last video, I went on and on about how Link to the Past and Ocarina of Time are the worst games ever, despite being completely different and that they never should have been made in the first place. There was one category I forgot to talk about. Mental interactivity. Upon replaying both games, it seems everything in Ocarina wants to give you a tutorial. You can't just breeze through it without getting stopped dead in your tracks by all this text, and that's another sign of its age. 3D games are a good deal more complicated. You have to use this thing. And no one reads the manuals. Back then it seemed like a pretty novel concept to just copy-paste your manual into the game and make the player play through it. When you want to use the codec, push the select button. When we need to contact you, press the select button. What they didn't seem to account for is that after getting used to it years in the future, you'd already know how to play the game. I guess SNES games had it easier because they're so much simpler to control. And Link to the Past, all you gotta do to move around is just push the controller direction buttons. In Ocarina of Time, you gotta know how to control the camera, you gotta know how to jump up and down and roll around and z-target onto things on top of controlling your dude. And the game seems pretty adamant about telling me that I need to do these things. Every time I look at anything, the fairy flies over, there's this weird rotating arrow over their head and this crosshair over the bodies. It plays this awful noise and the screen turns into a letterbox. I mean, hopefully, after about an hour, you get the idea of how to z-target on stuff, but they didn't make it very visually elegant. On the other hand, Link to the Past seems to want depth so much that it's really unintuitive about about it. Look at this abstract, gamey border around the edge of the screen. It looks like the whole game is pasted on a piece of old paper, but I'm not really sure that's what they were going for. It's a small detail, but shoots totally straight into my subconscious and makes trying to visualize the gameplay that much harder. You gotta jump through all these holes and somehow know where they go even though you can't see it. You just gotta infer from memorization and a vague sense of placement. Later on it turns into one big guessing game. Dungeon 5, how do I get in? Do I shoot it? Do I stab it? Do I magic powder it? Oh, I know, I bet I hammer it! What the fuck, I just pull the dungeon open? And suddenly these iron prison bars just snap off? So after all these years, I noticed my brain remembered a lot more of Ocarina than it did Link to the Past. Why? I don't know. Maybe it's because I played it first. See, there's this thing I like to call the virgin effect. The tendency for fans of a series to latch onto the first thing they consumed of that particular series, no matter how much it's improved since then. Though Ocarina wasn't my first Zelda game, that would be Zelda, thank you very much, I still played it before Link to the Past. And even as a child, back when every game from any era looked so magical and wonderful, the magic of Ocarina didn't stick onto the older game I played later. And you know what? A lot of this stuff is purely subjective. You can't quantify awkward animation cycles or weak sound effects. There's no mathematical formula for proving the superiority of either game, and it has a lot to do with time and place and- Wait a minute. Hang on a second here. In Link to the Past, you can only equip one usable item in your inventory slot. In Ocarina of Time, you can equip three. And it's not like Link to the Past is using its two trigger buttons for anything. All ten dungeons in Link to the Past are assembled from palette swaps of three different tile sets with only two visually unique dungeons in the whole game, Ice Palace and Turtle Rock. Whereas Ocarina's eight dungeons all have their own unique set of assets. Counting bottles and hook shots as one item, and including strategically swappable equipment, Ocarina has about seven more usable inventory items than Link to the Past and three more basic movement commands than the other games Walk, Slash, and Action. Plus the average playtime for Ocarina is about 12 hours longer than Link to the Past, and just- No, I'm trying to quantify this shit, and I really can't. There's room for a good counterpoint to everything I brought up. More isn't always better, and change isn't always good. But the thing is, despite trying, I can't really bring myself to dislike Ocarina, and I just caught myself going to absolutely stupid lengths trying to praise it. And that kind of scares me. I guess that means I really fell for the marketing pretty hard. Commercial environment. Business majors, take note, this shit they've pulled is genius. During the life of the first few Nintendo consoles, these games came out regularly but not very often. It was an opportunity for Nintendo to use everything they learned over the past four years or so and really create a magnum opus out of it. For such a long-lasting series, its first ten years only saw three console releases. Compare that to the first decade of other classic franchises, and you'll see that it wasn't a very oversaturated series. Usually had two Zelda games per platform. One of those games would be the really big deal, while the other was kind of a spin-off. Of course, the second NES game, Zelda II Adventure of Link, was much more lukewarmly received than the first. On the N64, Majora's Mask was more like an expansion pack than a full sequel, and the SNES had only one Zelda game, which was stylistically similar to the Game Boy Zelda that came out around the same time. But at some point after Majora's Mask, they started releasing spin-offs left and right. Two Game Boy Color games released one year after, each one being a separate adventure using the same assets. 
seasons and ages, kind of like Pokemon, red and blue. Two years after that was Wind Waker, and the same year they started going on this Four Swords tangent on the portables, it was like a whole nother type of game. Then there was Minish Cap, and the two DS games, and the really Japanese Tingle RPG, and the downright shameless crossbow training, and... My point is, back before the 2000s, this series wasn't a clusterfuck. How to create and exploit nostalgia by Nintendo. It ain't easy, but they did it. Step 1. Launch a series of carefully crafted iconic blockbusters built out of beloved cultural archetypes. Take your sweet time making them, don't let customers get tired of them too quickly, and make every one of them visually and mechanically distinctive. Take your time and put a lot of effort into it, and this series will ferment into an iconic mascot of your company's quality. Fifteen years later, go crazy making bank on everyone's nostalgia for how good you used to be. Lower your standard of quality, make new Zelda games every other year, no matter how rushed or starved for ideas they are. It won't matter, people will buy whatever shit has the name stamped on it. Remake it, remix it, get period appropriate celebrities to endorse it. Are you ready to save Princess Zelda in 3D? This series used to make a whole lot more sense than it does now. They were wholesome, rollicking, family-friendly adventures that managed to sneak in a few very mature and poignant themes, and that made them a great series of stories to grow up with. Themes like the tenacity of time and the ugliness of death, the inevitability of aging and the cynicism of adulthood and the innocence of childhood. The whole series from Link to the Past to Wind Waker seemed to weave an eerily complete arc about growing up and confronting childhood nostalgia. And after that game, all the series does now is appeal to nostalgia. And it's not doing it very well. Oh come on, I can't really be that cynical, can I? I guess this is what Zelda did to me. Maybe it's just because I'm a jaded adult and these games aren't made for my demographic anymore, but I mean don't get me wrong, the new games aren't terrible or anything, but since they don't feel as new and exciting as the old ones, they no longer feel like masterpieces. And that was the appeal that the old games used to have. That's the appeal that a lot of Nintendo games had before they decided to exploit the ever-living fuck out of our nostalgia for them. I can't keep track of this shit anymore. Nintendo stopped playing to the strengths of their franchises and they lost me somewhere in the process. It goes with their whole 21st century business strategy, I guess. Alienate the hardcore fans to appeal to the casual ones. But I don't really see myself falling into that camp. I used to love Zelda to death, but not for entirely respectable reasons. It's manipulative storytelling and period piece design and, well, that's why we love it or hate it. Looks like we're in trouble, princess. All we can do is run. 